Physician dispensed skincare is the most rapidly growing segment of the skincare market. So if you're not selling products in your practice, you're really missing out because this area is just growing so fast. Welcome back to the Medical Entrepreneur Podcast. We have Dr. Leslie Bauman, a former director of the University of Miami Cosmetic Medicine and Research Institute, a professor of dermatology. Uh, she founded the Cosmetic Dermatology Center at the University of Miami in 1997 and is the founder and CEO of the Bauman Cosmetic and Research Institute. Dr. Bauman has authored several dermatology textbooks um, with the New York Times bestseller, The Skin Type Solution. She's also the author of regular columns for the Miami Herald, Dermatology News, and Yahoo Health. So welcome, Dr. Bauman. Thank you so much for joining us on the Medical Entrepreneur Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's such an honor. The reason why um, I was just, uh, I'm so happy that you're here because your book, Cosmetic Dermatology, Principles and Practice, was the book that actually was kind of like one of the first books I ever read when I first got into aesthetic medicine. And so it was so cool to, to meet you in person after having, yeah, basically having you had mentored me into the field, you know? So. Oh, that's so great to hear. I think it's the cornerstone book for anyone who's practicing any cosmetic dermatology. You know, it was the first cosmetic dermatology book ever written, actually, in 1997. So you probably have the second edition. Do you have the one with the white cover? I think so. I think I have the second edition, correct? Yeah, yeah, the third edition just came out. But the first edition was a very skinny. It was like this big because Botox wasn't even approved by the FDA yet. So um, we talked about uh, Botox. We had heard of it and we had used it, but it was not. I did the original FDA trials for Botox in 98, 99, and, um, but, but the approval wasn't there yet when the book came out. So it's really, really funny to see the size of the first one versus the size of the one now. The field has just, you can just tell how much the field has grown just by looking at the size of the book. That is so true. I feel like aesthetic medicine in many ways is actually probably the fastest growing field of medicine. Would you say that? I would, I would. And I don't think I told you my story when I met, but um, I was a resident at the University of Miami in dermatology. And I always, my whole life, loved reading books about CEOs, female CEOs like Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubinstein and people like that. And I was always very business oriented. So the chairman of the derm department came to me at the end of my residency and said, you know, I heard this guy talking about something at a dermatology meeting. He, he said it was, there were only five people there. It was seven in the morning and everybody thought he's, cr he's crazy. But there's this thing called Botox and it, he says it works for wrinkles. And I'm, we have a big university um, or a big research center at the University of Miami. We want to be the site that does all the trials. What do you think about joining the faculty and, and doing, you know, being my cosmetic person since you have this interest? And I had read all these business books, so many, and I look at him, I'm 24, five years old, and I said, I'll do it, but I want to be the director of, dermatology, of cosmetic dermatology. I want my own cost unit, and I want my own budget, and I want complete control of hiring and firing. So the guy looks at me and starts laughing because here I am so young. And he goes, I'll let you do it, but I just want you to know you're going to be the director of yourself. And he started laughing. <laughs> so then 13 years later, it was a huge division with all these people. And I got to control my budget. I had complete autonomy. It was really, really great. And if it hadn't have been for all those business books, I wouldn't have known to ask for that. Man, that is amazing. It goes to show, you know, negotiating is totally worth it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you ever read Herb Cohen's You Can Negotiate Anything? It's a great book. Man, that's awesome. One of the things I was going to ask you about is maybe you could tell us a little bit more about kind of your background and like, how did you go from being interested in medicine in, to, to basically being focused on dermatology and then to, to even, you know, more subspecialty, especially at the time in 1997, like cosmetic dermatology was kind of like a new thing, right? Um, right. Tell us about and your journey. Yeah, when I was in um, when I was doing my residency, there was really just chemical peels and leg veins. There, there really wasn't anything else at the time. Um, I wanted to be a pediatric dermatologist originally because I I have eczema and I always was very interested in eczema and moisturizers and I always loved skincare. I collect vintage skincare ads, um, vintage um, products and compacts and things like that. And I've always, always loved that. So I just was fascinated with moisturizers and I wanted to do eczema research. So that was my track until my boss came and said, hey, I want you to join and do cosmetic dermatology. And it's interesting how 
you know, before I had I was interested in kids. Now I'm interested in making people look younger. It's they're very different, but a lot of the science is the same. How did you? I guess when you went to medical school, you always were so interested in dermatology, and you focused on that right away. Is that? No, you know, just like a lot of medical students, I wanted to be something very glamorous. You know, I wanted to be a heart transplant surgeon. I worked with Michael DeBakey at Baylor. I'm sure you're from Houston. You know yeah, who DeBakey yeah. was. So I was in college and I was in the summer surgery program. And um, I, back then there were no female heart surgeons at Baylor. And um, so I spent my, uh, my first three years of med school scrubbing in all the time on all these heart transplants. And then the very last year, um, back then they couldn't preserve the organs and, and fluid. You had to do the transplant right away. So it was the 4th of July weekend, and we had surgeries back-to-back, -back and we were in the OR about 52 straight hours. I mean, you went out to eat, but you came back, and I didn't sleep. And I thought, you know what? This is a hard life. I don't think I'm going to do this. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was a fourth-year student. I had done everything. I had a few electives left. So then I thought, maybe OBGYN, and then I didn't like that. So I went down to Galveston. My uncle was a dermatologist, and he said, why don't you come down and go to Grand Rounds? Maybe you'll like dermatology. And I went down there, and at the very last second in medical school, I fell in love with dermatology, and uh, that's what happened. But it was, dermatology is interesting because it's such a mix of everything. It's surgery and kids and pathology and cosmetics and all of that, that it just appealed to me because it, it had so many different opportunities. But it's, I wonder how many of us really end up being the kind of doctor we think we're going to be when we start medical school. What about you? Did you know what you were going to do? Well, I started out going into orthopedics because I was 100 percent sure I wanted to be a surgeon and do orthopedics, and um, and just like the same thing. So I started volunteering. I did research, um, and when I was in the OR and I saw my first knee replacement, the the sheer shock of the, for well, lack of a better word, like unrefined nature of the surgery, it just blew me away. Like I didn't expect people to be using like hammers and chisels and like. You know, because you always think of surgery as like, you know, some guy listening to classical music and doing these little micro, you know, small maneuvers and these things. And and when I saw that, I was like, what is going on here? And it was just so, it, it you know, it just kind of shocked me. And then I ended up actually going into anesthesia uh, instead. So <laughs> That's funny. That shocked me too on my orthopedic surgery rotation. I remember seeing the saws and thinking, what, did they just go to Home Depot to get the equipment? <laughs> exactly. That was like the Black & Decker surgeon, you know, so... <laughs> And then could you maybe tell us about, you know, kind of, um, it sounds like you were always interested in business, which is, you know, shows like you have an entrepreneurial drive. When you were in medical school and you were on your, your journey from, you know, going to, to medical school to residency, uh, did you have an idea that you wanted to do business? Like, how did that, um, can you maybe talk about your, your entrepreneurial journey and how that maybe led to the skin type solution book? I, I did, but I was so busy, you know, it's just so hard trying to do your residency and, and medical school and all that. I didn't really have a lot of excess time to read business books during that time period. But once I got into my re dermatology residency, it was actually a lot easier than medical school. So during my residency, I started reading business books again. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I felt like I just needed to amass as many skills as I could so that then I would be able to do it later. Because I ran a division of dermatology at the University of Miami, I had to learn how to read financial statements like P&Ls. I was actually on the finance committee at the university. So uh, there were all the HR, hiring, firing, job descriptions, all the basic type of things I had to learn how to do since I built that division from scratch. And then when I left the university in 2009, I had to build it all over again from scratch. So I've done it twice. And if, if I hadn't read all those business books and been in all the business lectures that I have in my life, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Because as you know, we learn no no business in medical school, which I think is terrible. I think they there should be a class. For sure, yeah. I mean, really, it's it's definitely a big detriment, and so many physicians, I think, really just uh, kind of any practitioner, you know, physician, nurse practitioner, whatever, they they come out, they have no business knowledge, and many of them have no idea about taxes or anything, you know, and they get right. they're, they're the biggest victim, you know, um, they get taken advantage of by most people, so. And I filed some patents and um, some copyrights and trademarks and all that. I didn't know what all that meant. I um, actually had, I, have you ever heard of a Miquimod? It's a, a cream that we use for skin cancer. Yeah. I actually uh -huh. patented that for wrinkles back when I was a resident because we saw that it was making wrinkles better. So I put all the paperwork into the technology transfer office at the University of Miami. And I got this little note back that said, 
the office has accepted your patent idea. So I thought I had a patent. I didn't know that that meant they accepted the fact that they get two thirds of the rights of it. So one day at lunch, I was saying to my the faculty, oh, guess what? I got a patent today. It was so easy. All you do is you fill out this form. And my boss says, no, I, there's got to be something wrong. So we go and check, and it turns out that the office had just sent me this letter and wasn't clear, and I never would have filed or known anything. The, the University Technology Transfer Office didn't tell me I needed to file with the government or follow up or anything. So luckily, I, I figured that out on my own, but wow, <laughs> you know, there wasn't any kind of infrastructure to, to help with that at my school. You bring up a really good point, which a lot of times what I see in, in uh, people who have contracts with big health systems is that they usually the health system owns all their intellectual property they could create. And just like you're describing, you could come up with an amazing breakthrough that you even did outside of all of your job hours, and then they still own it while you're under contract. Right. So I'm lucky my skin typing system, which I have a patent on, they relinquished the rights to me. And um, <laughs> the trick on that, since it's been so many years, it shouldn't matter to tell you the trick. The trick is to write the idea to the technology transfer office and make it sound really stupid so that they don't want, they so they release their rights. So I, I wrote like, people don't know what kind of cleanser to use and they don't know what kind of sunscreen and I'm going to figure out a way to help them. I mean, it sounded so dumb and they're like, oh, she can have that. <laughs> That's here a are, yeah, here we are years later and it's a, a successful company, but thank goodness. So, and I made sure I had it in writing from them also several different ways that they relinquished the rights. Maybe we could talk a little about the skin type solution and then you know, to be quite frank, uh, Dr. Bauman, a lot of people have, you know, skin quizzes and, and these kind of things. What makes yours different than everything else that's out there? So my skin type quiz has been, for 10 years, we've been validating it. It all started um, back in 2005. We had 300 questions and we studied the questions and we did things such as we measured people's sebum secretion rates and compared that to questions because studies show that 80% of people are wrong about when they guess if their skin is oily or dry. You can't just ask, are you oily or dry? So that was our first thing was to figure that out. We, then we did genetic tests at the University of Miami to double, see if the genes matched up with the sebum secretion and, and all of that. Then we tried um, the quiz in Colorado because I'm in Miami where it's hot and humid. So we tried it in Colorado and then we did it in India and Korea and um, China and some other countries to make sure it worked geographically in different places. Now, if you Google, if you go to Google Scholar and put in Bauman skin type, you'll see that the people all around the world are using the system now for research. And it's a standardized way to divide people into 16 skin types. But the key is if you don't accurately diagnose the skin type, then all that research, you're not comparing apples to apples. So it was very important that the quiz was absolutely accurate and that it could be done by anybody, not just a dermatologist. So it can be self-administered. And we even studied if it's accurate on a cell phone versus a laptop and um, all these different things. So over the, it's been since 2005, I'm not even sure how many years that is, I guess 18 years, something like that, that we've been working on that. And companies actually license the rights to the questionnaire whenever they're doing trials, if they want to prove that their drugs affect sebum secretion, for example, or, or wrinkles and things like that. So it's been, uh, so the other quizzes are just somebody thought of some questions and put them up and, and didn't validate it in any way. We absolutely know that our quiz gives you the right Bauman skin type. That is amazing. And uh, that's so true because, you know, so often I'll, you know, we'll see people that, oh, I took this quiz uh, on Facebook or something. And it's like, <laughs> what does it really mean? You know, <laughs> yeah, they'll, the first question is usually, are you oily or dry? And like I said, 80 percent of the time people are wrong and then they end up with the wrong skincare product. So my, I'm very passionate about matching people to the right skincare products. And I want to change the way people shop for skincare. I want them to learn what their skin type is, their Bauman skin type, they're 16, and then have them use that to make decisions. Whether they're, no matter what brand they're gonna use, or if they're gonna spend a lot of money or less money or whatever, I think everybody deserves this knowledge of being able to match their products to their skin type. And that's, um, it also helps in medical practices too, because, um, well, I should go back and tell you my story a little bit about how the whole thing happened, because then it'll make more sense. Yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> 
So, so I wrote the skin type solution in 2005 and it was a New York times bestseller. And, um, so not only did we have 6 million people reading our forum, we used to have a forum where there were 16 different forums and different skin types would talk to each other and everything. And that forum had a, a bunch of traffic, but people would come from all around the world to see me at the university of Miami to get a skincare regimen. And the problem is to do it right it takes 45 minutes to really sit there and ask them all these questions. And the university wasn't going to let me hire more people. And they wanted me to see more patients a day and pushing me and, you know, more output with less staff. So I had to figure out a way to streamline everything. So um, I figured out that I could divide people into 16 skin types. I got the idea from the Myers-Briggs personality test. It's the same thing. So with the skin typing system, there's four issues. You're either oily or dry, sensitive or resistant pigmented or non-pigmented, and that means uneven pigment. It's not about ethnicity. So you either have dark spots or you don't. And then the last one is wrinkles or no wrinkles. So you mix that and you get 16, like the Myers-Briggs. So I figured out that I could do that, but then I realized if I wanted my staff to help me, I needed to make sure that they diagnosed the skin type properly. So that's where the quiz came in, and that's why it was so crucial that we um, validate it and use it right. So we started using the quiz and then we had the skin type system and then I could preset my regimens for my patients. So if somebody came in and they were, um, you know, an acne, dry, pigmented, wrinkle type, I would already have it printed out and here you go. It, it was a lot faster. So then one day I realized I, I had 16 different piles of papers. You know, this was way before everything was computerized. And I thought I should do a book because I can just put all these in a book. It'll be easier. So that's when I got the book deal and the book came out. And, um, oh, wait, I, I got that out of order a little bit. But um, the book came out. And then um, in the book, we had $1 sign, $2 sign, and $3 sign products. But the problem with the book is they change the names of the products, especially those mass market $1 sign, like Neutrogena, Aveeno, all those. They change the names every year or two. So the book was oh. always out, always out of print. I mean, always out of, um, it wasn't correct. It was always wrong. The names were wrong. So I realized I needed to do it in some kind of digital manner. And then doctors started calling me and telling me they wanted to use this in their office. And there was no way really to protect it at the time. So we had these little laminated cards that the doctor carried on a ring in their pocket and they would find out the patient's skin type and they'd get the card and then they would write it down. And then um, we started out as a franchise because that's the only way you can control. I needed to control it because if people didn't use the quiz properly, then they wouldn't diagnose it right and then the skincare products wouldn't work. So we started out as a franchise. And, um, and people use the system. We had about 200 doctors do the franchise. And during that time, we built an e-commerce online store. We, we did everything digitally. And now it's, it's so cool how it works. Um, so that way, each, now each doctor can figure out what products they want to sell and what brands they want to sell. And so we've, over the last 10 years, has just been tweaking the software and making it customizable for each practice for someone who has a practice how they might use the what you know would they approach you in order to use the same quiz for their patients and right so um so now we do a licensing model because the franchise model um do you know anything about franchising by the way that was something i'd love for your viewers to just learn a little bit about so they won't do it, <laughs> they won't do it. <laughs> I, I just know just a little bit. When I look at the big franchises, they have a lot of lawsuits. Like look at Burger King, McDonald's, any of those guys. They they have to fight even with their own franchisees, you know. So when you do a franchise, you have to file in every state separately. So you have paperwork in every state. Every state has different rules. So you have to have a full-time franchise attorney. And you have to um, audit your books every year and turn those into every state. So we were franchised in about 33 states and it just takes so much paperwork to do that. And then when the doctor would want to use my system, there's this two-week cooling off period in the franchise world. So we would tell them all about it. Then we'd have to give them this 54-page franchise disclosure agreement that they would review for two weeks. And then if they were still interested, they would sign up. So you can see it's not so easy to grow a business when doctors are busy and they don't want to read these 54 pages and everything. So we changed to a licensing model um, now that SAS is a big thing. You know, that wasn't an option back then. So SAS is so much easier. So if a doctor wants to use my system, there are different levels. So it's a, to, because we know you're going to love it and you're going to sell a lot of products, it starts out very inexpensive so that people don't have a risk. So it's about $100 a month to get started. 
And then each level of the licensing um, has it gets a little bit more expensive. The final one, I think, is around $500 a month. And what's really different about those plans is what percent of the income you keep on the online store. So now you can use it in your office. I'll talk more about that in a second. But we are a huge e-commerce online store with a warehouse. We've been doing fulfillment now for eight years. And so you can use that. You, you Basically, you stick a link on your website and you have a complete turnkey online store within hours. It's so easy for you. And you can carry over 60 brands. So now people don't have to carry inventory. And this got really popular during COVID because people were working from home. So we had all these 200 franchises using our system in their office. And then during COVID, they had, had, you know, had to work from home. So people said, we want an e-commerce site. We want an e-commerce site. So that's when we launched the e-commerce site. So we handle all these doctors' e-commerce now. So if a doctor wants to do it, what happens is they go to sellmoreskincare.com. And we have everything is explained there. It, it does a better job of explaining it. I get so excited. And there's so many. I want to tell you all these details. <laughs> but it's all on skincare, uh, sellmoreskincare.com. And you can use it in your office. So basically, we have software that you go in and you pick what products you want to sell. So for example, let's say it's a retinol serum. You go in under retinol serum and there's a whole long list of brands and you pick which one you want to sell in your practice. You set it to that. Then going forward, that's the retinol serum that shows up in all your patients' regimens. And then if they go to your online store, it's the link. And it, it's my, it's, it's Skin Tape Solutions, but it looks like your online store. It has a white label with your branding and everything. They go there and um, that retinol serum is the one that's going to show up in the regimen. So what you tell your patients in the office matches what you do on your online store. And um, you can imagine all the programming that that took. Luckily, my husband is a tech guy, so <laughs> that's how I was able to get all this programmed. But so now um, it's super easy if you want to use it in your practice. And the great thing is, if let's say you have an esthetician, and um, or, or let's say you have somebody who doesn't estheticians know about skincare. Let's say you have somebody new working for you. Maybe they're a medical assistant. They know nothing about skincare. Now they can prescribe an exact perfect regimen that works without having to know anything. And if you're a doctor, maybe you said you're an anesthesiologist, maybe you don't know as much about skincare. This way you don't have to worry, it's all done for you. And there's so much science that backs up the regimens. We have 40,000 different regimen templates based on how you answer the questions. So however you answer the questions, the, there's this template and then the brands you picked pop into those slots. So there's, I, I like to say there's three levels of customization. There's customization at the doctor level of what products they want. There's customization at the level of the doctor doing the regimen for the patient because you can change things if you want to. And then there's customization for the patient because when they go to the online store, let's say they're vegan and they only want vegan products. You don't want to lose that sale for the patient. So they go and they see what retinol you recommend and they can scroll through all the other ones and find one that meets their preferences. So it's three layers of customization. And physician um, dispensed skincare is the most rapidly growing segment of the skincare market. So if you're not selling products in your practice, you're really missing out because this area is just growing so fast. That's, that's exactly what we see with a lot of medical spas. And I'll tell you, I see a lot of people who are escaping mainstream medicine and going into aesthetic medicine because a, it's, you know, allows them to be more creative. They enjoy doing it. You know, they're working with healthy people instead of sick people. There's so many advantages to it. But for a lot of them, they don't have a background in dermatology. They might have been a nurse uh, in the operating room who, you know, said, hey, look, I'm tired of doing this. I want to do my own. I want to do aesthetics. They got the training. They need to do that for them, they're probably missing that other piece of what you could, you could bring them, which is by using your quiz, they could essentially practice cosmetic dermatology just by following the instructions of the quiz. Is that correct? Right. Their skincare regimens that they give their patients will be as good as the ones I give mine. And this is where my passion comes in. I read every scientific article that comes out about skincare. I like to read science and nature and keep up with the science really early. I test all these products myself on all the different skin types. So you can be confident that what you're giving your patient, the, the regimen that you're giving your patient is going to work. And that sounds like, you know, people are going, of course it's going to work. But if you've done skincare and, and not known about it, there's so many things that can go wrong. You can give them a rash. The products will sting. It'll give them acne, all this stuff. And that hurts your credibility. They're not going to trust you as a doctor if you get their skincare wrong. 
Skincare is a gateway drug to other cosmetic things, I, I like to joke. So people usually do skincare first before they do toxins and fillers. So you've got to get it right. And there's no way to keep up with it unless you're like me where you're just fanatical about this stuff. So I am very passionate about making sure that everyone gets the right skincare. So I want to help these doctors and nurses and PAs and NPs and RNs and, every, and estheticians get the right regimen to their patient because we can really affect skin health if we can get people on the right things. And it's not just about telling them the right thing and giving them the right regimens. It's about getting them to do it. There's so many studies that one out of every three prescriptions is filled and 25% of people use the right amount of product. The rest of the people, 75% are not putting enough on. So when you take the quiz, the patient gets a, a customer journey that's wonderful. So depending on what their skin type is, they get an email, um, this is what your problems are, these are the products that are recommended for you, this is what to expect. And in 30 days, it'll say things like, your brown spots should be getting better, if they're not, click this link to learn what to do, or if you have redness. So we handle all of that interaction. I want those patients to feel like their, their provider is right there with them, walking them through the skincare routines. And so every 30 days, they get something till about day 90. And then day 90, um, they're encouraged to take the quiz again and, and get started again. Because one mistake people make is you're not on the same skincare products. You get your skin type, you get your regimen, and you're not on that for the rest of your life. You know, your skin cares, your skin type's going to get better. Maybe your inflammation goes away and you don't need anti-inflammatories anymore. You need a stronger retinol. Maybe we want to add growth factors. So the, being interactive with the, the customers and the patients, we can help keep them involved and engaged with us and educate them and get them to be compliant. So I call it diagnose, prescribe, educate. And that's what the system does for you. You don't have to know a thing about skincare. All you have to do is get, go to sellmoreskincare.com, sign up to be a licensee, which you can do right there on the site. You don't even have to talk to us on the phone. You just do it right there on the site. And we put a link on your website and boom, you have a huge e-commerce site with fulfillment. The packages don't come in some ratty box from Amazon. They're like, come on, nice and different brands in the same box. You know, right now, if you buy SkinCeuticals here, SkinMedica there, it all comes in a separate box. This comes all nice in one regimen. And you can mix brands together too. So you can tell I love what I do. <laughs> For sure, yeah. And I think it's, it's definitely much needed. And you have a really good point because uh, when I actually had the chance to meet you in person, you mentioned how much time you spend reading, studying, and writing every day. It just blew me away. Could you maybe talk about how you've and you've dedicated your 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 ability to like you focused your all of your you know learning abilities and and anal analytical abilities to do this. And I think it's a very very valid point to like most people who are in practice don't have time to even get to have what you're doing. So if they can if they can learn from you and follow your shortcut, it's a huge advantage. Right. And I like to say I'm brand agnostic. So I'm all for the science. So I'm not partial to one brand over the other. And I write blogs. So at skintypesolutions.com, if you go to the library or skintypesolutions.com forward slash library, I write, um, I have blogs on everything. So if you if your patient has a question, for example, I think people need two different cleansers. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, if you use the same cleanser morning and night, you're missing out on some of the benefits of cleansers. So patients will say, well, why do I need two cleansers? If you don't know the answer to that question, come to the website, put in, why do I need two cleansers? And there's a whole blog that'll explain it to you. So being a provider, if you have any kind of questions about skincare at all, hopefully I have a blog on it. And if not, just send me an um, email at info at skintypesolutions.com. I, I always need ideas because I do. I write a blog every day. And so, wow. you know, I like to patients come in with all these TikTok things. Uh, recently, people were rubbing banana peels on their face and TikTok, and that became a thing. So I wrote a blog um, on banana peels and, you know, that so that way, when your patients come in after watching TikTok and they ask you these questions, you know what the answers are. So I want to be your, re your resource for education as well as what products are right. Now, also, the companies, they're going to market to you and tell you all kinds of things. Like, they're going to tell you that their products all work best together when you use all of their same brand of products. Because, of course, they want you to buy their cleanser, their sunscreen, their moisturizer, their serum, and all that. But think about it. 
If you're somebody like SkinCeuticals who has amazing vitamin C technology, Sheldon Pinnell, who was the chairman at Duke, invented that, Chinese, that vitamin C technology, is great. That doesn't mean that they have the best cleansers or the best moisturizers. You know, I don't like their triple lipid repair moisturizer. It's not a true barrier repair moisturizer. So I would rather take a moisturizer from a different brand and put that in with the SkinCeuticals. So I cherry pick the best products from all the different brands and put them together in the regimens. Now, I told you before that people, the doctors and the providers go into the software and they pick what products they want to sell. Some doctors, actually 80% of the doctors don't even want to do that. They just want me to tell them which one. So I talk to them about what price point they want to sell in their practice. Again, I call it $1 sign, $2 sign, or $3 signs. And then I, I pick it for them. So they don't, they don't even have to choose that if they don't want to. Now, if they do want to be all one brand, like all SkinCeuticals, you can, there's a setting on there. You can make it all SkinCeuticals. And if they're private label, um, we can do that too. Assuming their products are good, because I'm not going to put them in the system if they're terrible. But if the products are good, we can put that in the system as well. I think this is such a huge advantage. And then for someone who maybe is, um, we, we see a lot of medical entrepreneurs when they're starting out, they might be working at a, a salon suite while they're doing Botox, filler, um, maybe some microneedling with uh, PRP or, or you know exosomes or something. Um, for someone like that who maybe doesn't have a huge area for inventory, uh, is the skin type solution also for them? Absolutely. They don't have to carry any inventory at all. They can have the patient take the quiz in the office and then see the regimen and then have it mailed to them by us. So you don't have to have any inventory. Well, wow, that's a huge advantage because I know for some of these um, you know, skin lines, they're $2,000, $2,500 buy-ins. They're not, they're not cheap, you know. And for somebody kind of, you know, starting out their practice, it, you know, it's difficult to justify that, you know. Right. And then also you have to put all your cash gets tied up in inventory. And then if you're not comfortable selling, you end up with all these things that expire or you change your mind and you like a different brand and you're stuck with this old eye cream you don't want anymore or your staff steals it or patients steal it. Having inventory, if you read business books about that, you don't want inventory if possible. <laughs> it's so true. Exactly. Uh, that's, and that's amazing because I actually saw a statistic saying that I think it was 99% of medical practices have had some form of embezzlement whether it was people stealing products or stealing money. Um, it's, so it's definitely out there. We did. We got embezzled. Oh, it was terrible. Basically, the guy um, mess made, we thought, we didn't know what was going on, but he made um, QuickBooks and, and Excel and everything, all the files so confused and messed up that we thought it was a software issue. And then we got it all cleaned up, and it turns out he had stolen like $150,000. But we, we um, pressed charges, and, and he ended up having to pay it back. Wow, good job. It took me two years, but I don't, I don't like people <laughs> messing with me. I'm a Texas girl. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, would you have any suggestions to anybody who is maybe in what we call the current mainstream medical system? They feel a passion to maybe do something on their own. Um, you know, what advice would you have as a medical entrepreneur yourself for someone who is reaching out to maybe do their own thing? Try to talk to other entrepreneurs and other people in the industry as much as you can. And because we just don't know what we don't know. And there's so many things I didn't know that I didn't know and mistakes that I made in the past. I think one recent mistake that I've decided that I don't, I'm going to not make any more is I'm one of these planning people that thinks 10, 20 years ahead. So I, um, for example, I've collected data on my patients. Um, every single visit, I take a picture with the Canfield camera and I track the results. And that's one of the ways I track all the regimens. I've been doing that for 20 years. So I, I always plan ahead on these things, but now you can't plan ahead anymore. And a lot of things, cause the world's changing. I mean, who knew AI was going to happen? And who knew? I mean, there's just so many things. So, for example, when we first built our online store, there wasn't Shopify. My husband was a tech guy, and we did our own online store, programmed it ourselves because all these fancy bells and whistles that it does. And now Shopify does a lot of that for you. So we took all of this um, programming about the regimen and all that. We were able to just uh, hook it up to Shopify. And it's so much easier because now Shopify has to deal with adding PayPal and Apple Pay and all that. And we don't have to do it anymore. Who knows in five years, it might not be Shopify anymore. It might be the next thing. So that's my point is wait till the last second to make any technology decisions. 
Now, that wouldn't have helped me because 10 years ago we didn't have Shopify and we had to do ours on UltraCart. But an UltraCart was the best back then. But, um, but Shopify is so much easier. And, and also, the whole thing about the inventory and the warehouse and all of that, we, we had UPS come in and help us set it up because it's a huge 6,000 square foot facility. And the UPS has systems where they come in and help you optimize everything so you're putting things in the right area so it's faster for the guys who pack the boxes. So just use your resources out there and find what's out there. Uh, like Again, we didn't know that UPS would do that. Luckily, one of the guys who works with me worked for UPS, and, and he told me that that would happen. So, um, you know, it's funny because when I was young in my 20s, it was always a 10-year plan and a 20-year plan, but I don't think you can do that anymore. What, what do you think? <laughs> do you agree no, with me not. that it's hard to look out in the future so far now? You're 100% right. I think the only thing you can do is hold to maybe the vision that you want to have happen, um, realizing that everything that you see around you is going to change. I mean, the reality, I guess, is in this world, everything changes. I mean, even your every cell in your body, technically, atomically, is different every seven years. So, um, you know, nothing is really stable, but it, the amount of uncertainty now is higher than it's ever been before. But with that comes amazing opportunities because um, just like, for example, in our, we have a, a kind of a, a coaching program for people that are in aesthetics that need support where they have an aesthetic mentor. And uh, our social media mentor is an influencer that's like 150,000 followers uh, in the beauty space. And one of the things I learned from her was just how many people are seeking the knowledge that you have out. And sometimes it's the simplest stuff that you may not even give yourself credit for that you could put online to help someone else. It's kind of the same way that you built the skin type solution to help other people. You, you basically made this solution and there's so many people now, like you could literally just use TikTok and have a huge audience and end up selling skincare from your house, which, you know, 10, 20, 10 years ago, was not even a possibility, you know? Right. So, and you can do that right now, by the way, with skin type solutions, we give you a link or a QR code, you put it on TikTok and boom, all those people, the sales, you don't do a thing, you don't mail anything, you don't buy anything, we handle all of it and you get the income. I think that's a really great point because, you know, if you're somebody who, for example, has, you know, so you have 50,000 followers on Instagram, uh, I think it's a very achievable goal to, to reach that. Um, and I think basically if you're putting out content, then you could literally just drive everybody to the skin type solution quiz, which is, you know, it's proven scientifically to help them. So, you know, you're doing the right thing. And just like you said, you guys have built all the infrastructure to manage it. So it makes it so easy for an entrepreneur to plug in because you've solved a lot of the business problems for for us, you know. Right. And we track it. So we know that if someone takes the quiz, they buy 33% more products and spend about 30% more money if they ha than if they have not taken the quiz. And that's wow. just the original, the initial purchase. Then we have this whole customer journey and the emails and you'd be shocked at our conversion rates. They're amazing in the email campaign because people have taken the quiz and you know, you, they can tell it's custom advice. So um, people, and I'm not somebody who wants to go on TikTok and do all those videos and everything. So if somebody out there is doing it, I do it and use my typing system and make a ton of money and help me get people to use the right skincare. That's what I want is I want to change the way people shop for skincare so that they buy the right stuff and they have better skin. I love that. And I think for so many reasons, the fact that you're brand agnostic it helps so much because I see a lot of people that are considered pillars of the industry in aesthetic medicine. And for whatever reason, they get close to one brand and that brand is supporting them or helping them or, you know, they like the reps or whatever. And, and then they, they kind of lose their ability to be agnostic. And it makes total sense like what you say, because, I mean, every every business has its own strong suit. Right. And so it would not make sense for one business to have all the strong suits, in one, you know, and, and, you know, so it does make sense that there would be like one product from this company, and another product from that company that would actually be superior than to having everything from one company. Right. And then also the companies, they want you to believe that one product is right for everybody. And that's not the case. There's 16 skin types. So um, that's another problem. With they, one company can't have 16 different moisturizers. That's just not practical for them. I mean, some of the huge ones, I guess, do. But in general, you don't have that. So that's why it's better to be able to pick from different ones. Man, I love that. I think you have an amazing solution for many of the medical entrepreneurs out there. And I just I love the fact that there was this gap. You had to deal with basically getting patients through because you're being essentially overtaxed by your job. Uh, and, and then 
you built this the system that allowed you to do that and it turns out it also helps so many other people it's amazing and it ended up being a business and it was really just to make my life easier and um, there's so many other things too. In the quiz, we ask them what other cosmetic concerns they have and about, you know, do you have 11s? Do you have parentheses? Do you have brown spots on your skin? And on the average, people answer three to four of those. So you're also building yourself a lead list using our quiz of people who might be interested in toxins or interested in fillers. So that's why I joke that it's a gateway drug because it really is. And we know, we've noticed that maybe you've noticed this too, but men always seem to buy eye cream first. So men buy an eye cream, then they start getting interested, and then they'll do Botox. I actually have 30% of my patients are male, which is very unusual. And um, one of the reasons maybe because skincare or maybe their wives bring them in, but I think that men are getting more and more interested in these things. And that's such a part of the pie that's wide open out there that you know most men haven't done things. You're 100 percent right. In fact, we actually released a training video on how to do Botox and filler for men, um, just because like we've seen a big increase um, as well. I, it seems like the, the maybe the taboo around Botox and these things has, has you know faded away. And I think a lot of for a lot of guys that I've seen in in our clinic, they're they're not doing it out of vanity. They're doing it out of necessity. Like many of them are either people that interact with other people, like salespeople. Um, I would say a big chunk of them are executives that they still want to feel relevant. Um, you know, they, they've gotten older and there's younger guys now kind of coming to the picture. And while I think from what I hear from them as patients, you know, they still have superior knowledge and these kind of things. They don't want to appear that they're getting old or that they're fading away. Uh, and the sad part is, is that people judge us very heavily on our appearance. It's just a fact of life, you know. Right. And also the, all, with all this popularity and all the anti-aging medications and supplements, I love all the, the epigenetic research and all of that, that mainstream people are talking more and more about preventing aging and, and how to address aging. So they're caring more about their skin and wanting retinols and, and maybe even going to wear sunscreen every day, which would be amazing if people would do that. So you're seeing even men care about that now. And anybody, I've noticed, maybe it's only in Miami, but any man under about 40, 35 for sure, maybe 40, seems to care more about skincare. It seems to be over 40 that people aren't really as interested. So think about that with your young clients. That's a really great point. Uh, and I definitely see an increase also, um, you know, in a, we see in our clinics and we see in our, our trainings is that from a lot of people that are, are running either a med spa or an aesthetic practice, I've personally seen many businesses where 50% or more of their income, the revenue for their entire practice is from skincare. I mean, it has become a major driver of their business. Wow, that's great. That's great. If you're, if anybody out there is trying to calculate things, it looks like from the data we have from 250 offices that the average purchase is about $160 per visit of skincare when you do it right. Wow. So when you count, you can calculate how many patients you have coming through, and do that by 160, and that should be how much you're making. And then you also have that opportunity if you have the online store to capture them later. But one great thing about having e-commerce also is then they can tell their friends. Um, you can you can also, I was talking earlier about TikTok, how you can post your the QR code or the link on social media and get clients. For me, I'm because I'm a dermatologist, anytime I'm at a party, somebody comes up and says, hey, what do you think about this eye cream or what, what cream do you think I should use? And, you know, you're at a party. You don't really want to talk about work that much. Now I can say, hey, here, scan this QR code and it'll it'll figure everything out for you. So then they're going to go purchase later and I didn't have to talk about it at a party and it works for everybody. And it's more accurate than me trying to just guess right then in the middle of a party. Uh, doesn't that always happen? It, whenever you go, they got, oh, I, oh, I heard your, I heard your doctor. I want to ask you a question. You know, <laughs> I never tell someone I'm a dermatologist on an airplane because the whole rest of the flight, they're showing me their mold. <laughs> 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 I promise it always happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's some very very good advice. Um, I was wondering also if you might be able to comment. Uh, one thing we're also seeing from the data and also just in our our, our personal practice and our trainees' practices, we see a big increase for uh, alopecia, like basically people with hair loss and these kind of things. Um, do you, could you maybe speak to that as well? I do. I still do a lot of FDA trials. We do all the toxin and filler trials, but I do a lot of pharmaceutical drug trials too. 
there are a lot of alopecia drugs coming out, uh, a lot of these biologics, the JAK inhibitors and things like that. So if you are going to have a large hair loss population, you need to get up to speed on the science. Now, I'm not an expert on hair loss. I'm, I'm a skincare person, so I don't, I'm not up on all that. So I send my patients to somebody at the University of Miami, but that field is growing so much. So I do think that if someone's interested, there's actually stuff that works now. Would you also suggest anything for someone who is maybe starting out their practice um, in, you know, maybe they're a nurse that was, you know, in the hospital and now they're doing some Botox fillers, these kind of things. Um, they're they're going to come to see you for the skin type solution. Um, any other advice you might have for someone who's just starting out getting into this field of aesthetic slash cosmetic uh, dermatology, you know? Well, if they do use skin type solutions, then there are different companies that they can buy things through us. So, for example, Dysport and, and different injectables. And that way they they get more of a group discount, which they don't get when they're new. They're, when you're a new Medispa, you're paying top dollar for all your stuff because you don't have any power yet. You can use our power with a lot of the brands, whether it's skincare or whether it's toxin and fillers. That's not our primary business, but it's a perk that we give you um, whenever you come on board with us. Wow, that's a huge deal. Because you're exactly right. A lot of people, when they first start out, it's uh, <laughs> the, everything more expensive to you than it is to the, the gigantic med spot down the road. Yeah. Right. But I don't want people to join us because they want to get their fillers and toxins cheaper. So we'll actually turn you down because we don't want to be a GPO. That's just a perk. What we want to do is get the right skincare in patients' hands. So we'll only let you come on board if you're really very passionate about trying to give the right skincare to your patients. Is there anything that uh, you would recommend that the entire industry stop doing? Things that are going on in, in the industry that, that maybe we need to change? Well, um, I am a rule follower and I do do research trials. So it drives me crazy when people are experimenting with things and not tracking the data. So for example, when you're using those little aqua gold um, microneedling and you put in a little filler, a little toxin, a little B12 and you're injecting it and nobody knows what that does to the skin, that I don't think we should be doing that. I mean, this is, these are biologic weapons, actually. That botulinum toxin was a biologic weapon originally. And we don't, we really need to be more controlled. And I think people, as more and more people are getting in the field, they're not being cautious enough. And when we start seeing bad problems out there, which we will see, I'm from Miami, so, you know, it's everything's crazy here. So we see bad stuff. The rest of the world is going to start seeing that. That's going to hurt all of us because it's going to make the patients afraid to get things done. You can make a lot of money. I'm not saying you have to stay with um, label indications and only inject the areas that are approved by the FDA because um, I do masseters and things that aren't approved yet. But don't do the crazy stuff. You don't have to differentiate yourself by being a cowboy and being the first one to, you know, do the trap talks or whatever. Have you heard about that? People are doing trap talks. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to do that because I don't want people to have arm weakness and all these things. So I think we need to stick with what works and what's safe and, and all work together to build the credibility of the specialty, especially with all these new people coming on board. The, the problem with the new people is hard for them to get trained. It's hard for them to get good training, too. So they're having to teach themselves. And um, so, you know, we, I just want to say to everyone, exercise some caution. One of the reasons I wrote the third edition of my textbook, and it talks about it in the, the acknowledgement in the intro in the beginning, is that I want all these people enter, entering the field. I want them to be able to do things right. And so that we can protect patients, because otherwise, the, what if the FDA jumps in and starts changing the rules and the regulations and all that? We don't we don't want that scrutiny. So we need to all um, do a better job of protecting our patient safety. Is there anything that you feel that people in the industry should do more of or something they're not doing that they should do? Well, I'm, I'm biased, but I don't think that people are spending enough time with skincare with their patients. Every procedure you do is going to work better if you have the patient on the right skincare. That is very, very true. I've seen that, you know, in, in our practice 100%. And always the patients that, to the point where sometimes we, we even say, like, hey, we're not going to actually treat you if you don't do the skincare regimen. Uh, because just like that, we know the results are going to be so much more effective. We know the customers are going to be so much happier. They're going to refer more customers, you know. Definitely a great point. 
And it's such a way to differentiate yourself. So for example, the elastin skin nectar, if you use that two weeks before doing a wounding procedure like a microneedling or chemical peels, they will heal faster. And then you look like a better provider because your patients are healing faster. We know that if you use retinoids before a procedure, you're going to heal faster. But if you use retinoids after procedure, they're going to heal slower. So using skincare to get better results will, you know, make you look like a better doctor, a better provider, a better everything. The other thing is time matters too. I've been doing this for 25 years now, and I remember 25 years ago telling my patients, you're going to thank me in 25 years if you use your retinoids every day. Well, now it's 20 years later. My patients look better than everybody else's in town. The way I get most of my patients is word of mouth, 90%, because their skin looks great because they've been using Retin-A for 25 years and someone sees them at the grocery store and says, oh my gosh, who do you go to? You know, I, I, here we are thinking 20 years down the road again, but you've got you've to do that. If you get patients on skincare that works, they're going to look better and people are going to ask them what their secret is and you're going to get more patients. I think that's, I think it's really true. And, and what I also see in the industry, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it is I see a lot of people that maybe start out with procedures. They learn the Botox, they learn the fillers, they learn, you know, maybe PRP, that kind of thing, or PRP microneedling, but then they don't have any knowledge of what we consider dermatology. The, you know, many of them are, are nurses who maybe have trained in a different form of medicine. And so like dermatology is a brand new field for them. Uh, any advice for those people, um, that, you know, maybe are not familiar with it. Like how could they learn? Cause you know, besides your book, I don't think there's really that many resources out there. That is a great question. And I think the most important thing for them to learn first is what a melanoma looks like. I've actually joked that Botox has saved four of my patients' lives because they came in for Botox and I saw a melanoma on them. And they can trick you. So I, I wish that all the training courses would show everybody what that is because you're going to be seeing your patient's scalp and other areas on their back and neck and things that they might not see themselves. So my advice is really learn the important stuff first, like how to diagnose a melanoma. And then after that, it you know, dermatology, it's a four-year residency. So I, you can't really learn all the, there's a million, million diseases and funguses and all that stuff. So you really need to learn the, the ones that are dangerous. Anything that gives you fever or blisters, those are life-threatening. So learn the fever blister diseases first. And then pretty much otherwise, they can follow the, the skin type solution to treat majority of the patients You know, beyond that. Well, if it has to do with anything that affects your appearance, acne, rosacea, melasma, um, cellulite, stretch marks, all that kind of stuff, you can learn in my library at skintypesolutions.com forward slash library because I talk about all of those things. But, um, if, but when you're talking about dermatology, I was thinking rashes and things that grow on you and all of that. I don't feel that the, the new providers should even mess with any of that. It's, they could miss something really important. There's all kinds of rare cancers and things like that. Absolutely. So if they see something unusual, refer to the dermatologist. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <Gotcha. laughs> and if you want your dermatologist in town to like you, send them skin cancer patients or skin check patients. They, you know, you don't have to be competitors. There's so many general dermatologists out there that aren't doing cosmetics that would probably like to have a good relationship with the Medispa nearby them. That's a really great point because a lot of people do feel like I think there's a little bit of a rivalry or they feel like maybe they're being trouble, you know, because they're doing aesthetics and the dermatologist may not like them or something. But, you know, every time I've reached out to a dermatologist, like even here in Southlake, always friendly, always nice. And, and like you said, like they weren't actually even interested in practicing what we consider like aesthetic medicine. They're, they're, they're busy. <laughs> they're busy dealing with the skin cancers, biopsies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. There's a big split in the dermatology world. You're either a general dermatologist or you're a cosmetic dermatologist. Most people are not both. So for example, I've never taken insurance in my life. I don't know anything about it. I've been a cosmetic dermatologist from day one. But the general dermatologists, they don't know anything a lot of times about toxins and fillers and they have no interest in that. So find the general dermatologist in your area and, and become friends with them and send them patients. Because, um, you know, they're very, most, most general dermatologists are very passionate about skin cancer and curing skin cancer in people. So the more you can send them, the happier they're going to be. And Dr. Bauman, is there any uh, places where people could follow your work? 
I have lots of different websites and things, but I'm most active at skintypesolutions.com in the library there. There's okay. also skintypesolutions.com forward slash ingredients. So if you want to look up different skincare ingredients, I happen to write a column every month for dermatologists about different ingredients. So I rewrite that at a, with less science in it on the website too. So you can, you can search by the ingredient name on the website or by the topic name if you want to. Wow, what I'm a also reason. LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. I'm very, I'm active on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. It's the only social media that I really like because it's more <laughs> career and science oriented, you know. That's true. Less of the drama. So. Oh, I was just going to say, every time I go on Instagram, I end up buying some piece of clothing that I don't need. So that doesn't happen to me on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. I, I know you also wrote a book about nutraceuticals. And I feel like this is an area that people just don't even understand or they don't have on their radar. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the nutraceuticals and what you, you see their benefit or how they might be practiced in aesthetic medicine? The textbook I wrote is on cosmetic ingredients and cosmeceuticals, and some of those are nutraceuticals as well. So, for example, vitamin C, you use it topically, you also can take it orally. So each ingredient, and also in my blogs at, at skintypesolutions.com, I also have the oral nutraceutical information too. But I go through each ingredient in that book and I talk about the topical studies and the oral studies and the science behind it and what Bauman skin type it, it's for. Now that, the cosmetics ingredients in the cosmeceutical book is pretty hardcore. You have to love science to like that book. If you don't really want to hear like about all the little interferons and, <laughs> and uh, sirtuin proteins and all that stuff, then do read the skintypesolutions.com one. That's written more for consumers. Well, excellent. It's been such a pleasure having you on the Medical Entrepreneur Podcast. And what an honor. Um, you really are, you know, you've created an entire field that really defines, um, you know, how cosmetic dermatology is practiced. So, Well, thank you. And I just, uh, please, with the audience, tell all your friends about this. Help me spread the word. Um, we're not, we don't have big, huge PE backers or anything like that to do lots of marketing. We've been doing it word of mouth. And it's people like you out there that are helping me build my business. So thank you so much. My pleasure.